Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to ET Energy World webinar. To present this webinar, I welcome Mr. Aditya Gandhi, Senior Director, Technology, Sapient Consulting, on the topic Crude Global Supply Demand Dynamics and Impact on India. There will be a presentation on the topic followed by a question and answer session wherein you may submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Now I request Mr. Aditya Gandhi to start the presentation. Over to you. Hey guys, good afternoon. Um, this is Aditya Gandhi here. Um, so uh, I've been with SAPIT for about 17 years, and over this time, I have helped uh, a number of global oil and gas companies, large power utilities, and lead leading merchant trading firms uh, devise and implement strategies around uh, trading and their supply chain. Uh, today, uh, what I'll do is I'll talk to you guys about CRU, right, and more specifically about global supply and demand dynamics and its impact on India. Um, <clears throat> what I plan to do is um, um, so I guess there is an issue with sharing um, uh, should be just to confirm um, is the screen clearly visible I, I was getting some message here Uh, yes, Mr. Gandhi, we are able to see it, but not on a full screen mode. Okay. C can you confirm now? Yes, it's visible now. Agenda. Okay. We can see the agenda. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So before I get into agenda, I wanted to quickly call out that uh, the information that you will see in this presentation, most of it is coming from public sources. Um, so there's information from EIA, IEA, uh, BP Energy Outlook, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, OPEC Reports, and uh, CME. Okay. Um, what I plan to cover today is um, I'll start by talking a little bit about OPEC and shale, right? and from that get into some of the key supply risks uh, over over the medium and the long term. And then I'll talk about demand growth and uh, two very important topics that impact that efficiency and uh, electric vehicles, uh, how they are expected to impact demand and build that up into the overall demand risks and what the key factors will be that will impact demand over the next uh, decades. Okay, And after we talk about supply and demand, we'll talk a little bit about supply demand balance and therefore what the, does that mean for the overall uh, price movement and then we will talk about the India impact. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, before getting into all of these details, I wanted to just quickly show you guys a snapshot of where prices are at. Uh, obviously, most of you would be well aware of this. Right now, what I have plotted here in the first graph is the WTI and Brent prices over last um, three, three and a half years. And as you will notice, the prices have gone through a significant um, change uh, over this time frame, going from as high as 100 to going down to about 40 and then rising again um, to the 70, 75 range. Right? So that's one thing on this chart that is uh, clear. The other thing to note is if you look at how the differentials between these two um, crude grades uh, have been um, trading uh, at start of 15 and through most of 15 the differentials were relatively high right now well over ten dollars slowly those differentials vanished and through most of 2016 the differentials were almost zero and then again in late part of 2017 the differentials started going up again and there was a reasonable differential of over $5 that got built up. Uh, and, and since then, it's been in that range, occasionally going down. Uh, and right now, it's still in the uh, $4 or $5 range. Yeah. 
the other uh, thing and this is background right um, the other important thing to keep in mind uh, as we go through and look at what's happening with supply and demand is uh, this next curve uh, which shows wti uh, forward curve across deliveries from may 2018 all the way to uh, 2026 and you'll see that this curve is in clear backwardation right what this means is that currently if you were to buy a future for the nearer term you will pay a higher price versus if you were buying a future which is further out um, in terms of delivery okay now with this context in mind uh, let me uh, show you guys one other set of information right um, to indicate how prices have been changing and how the um, perception of people about how prices will change in the future is evolving right and it's really a divided world where people are on different extremes of this equation right now some examples um, uh, on the slide right? goldman has been talking about the new oil order which is really about oil going lower for even longer right that, that's the theme that they've been talking about However, they've also talked about the fact that they expect oil to surpass $80 in the near term. However, over next two years, it should actually pull down again uh, to the $1.60 range. On the other hand, Woodmac uh, talks about the fact that there's been a huge cut in CapEx across the industry. In fact, there's been over a trillion dollars worth of cuts in CapEx um, uh, in uh, the oil and gas industry and that should have a significant impact on future supply and therefore prices uh, and, and then there are companies that build on top of that like energy aspects who have talked about the fact that crude price could go over dollar hundred but then on the other end uh, iea has a slightly different view iea feels for example for this year that there is going to be explosive growth in production in us Right. And therefore, the need for OPEC supply will reduce and therefore prices will remain subdued. Right. And you'll see uh, this sort of uh, contradictory factors, uh, a lot of these uh, factors that potentially could push up or push down prices of oil. Uh, well at play and through this presentation, my aim is to talk to you guys about what are some of those key factors that you should be looking out for, which can have an impact on the crude price. Yeah. So with this, um, let's get into the agenda. Let's talk about supply first, right? And in supply, let's start with US and US obviously driven by shale, right? Um, shale has obviously revolutionized the uh, the oil world it has changed the paradigm from a point where we used to talk about peak oil to the point where need for oil may eventually go off and we may have enough supply to sustain us well beyond that point right and this chart um, in a way depicts that now, if you notice from 2012 to early 2016 uh, us production went up by about 50% uh, and then when uh, OPEC decided to uh, regain market share and they, uh, uh, in a way, cut loose on their production, uh, price uh, the U.S. production dropped a little bit, but it was relatively resilient. And then again, over last year and a half, it has gone up by 25%. Right? So overall, uh, U.S. has significantly increased its production. It is close to record levels in terms of its overall production, something that was not uh, uh, anything that people would have imagined 15, 20 years back, that U.S. could regain that, those levels of production. And this has completely changed the equation in the oil world. And it has changed the equation in the oil world for a few different reasons. Right? First is just increase the amount of oil that was available. Uh, but then even more important, uh, this technology has enabled reducing cost of production and it has very rapidly decreased the lead time from saying when somebody decides that they want to uh, dig for oil to actual production. Right? So it's not like the normal large capex cycles you would typically expect in the oil and gas space where you have to plan for next 
15 to 20 years. You need to make investments for seven, eight years and then start reaping those benefits. Uh, rather than that, uh, shale provides the ability to plan at much shorter time span to be able to react to market forces very quickly right? and at reasonable costs. Um, and that, that's why the, that equation has changed significantly. Uh, now, if you talk about what else has been going on with um, shale production in US, right? So as these charts show, clearly production has been going up. And if you look at all predictions that are out there, the expectation is that this production will continue to grow for next decade or two. This is going to be one of the most significant sources of increase in oil supply for next two decades, right? But it's not just about next two decades. If you look at even right now, with all the production increase that has happened, in spite of that, um, there's a huge frack log that is out there. Now, frack log um, is actually a term that I think someone at Bloomberg had coined maybe about two years back. What that really talks about is fracking backlog, right? So that's the term. And what, what that really means is that um, there are a huge number of wells right now in US which have been dug up. Most of the work on the wells is done. It's just that we have not extracted oil out of those wells. So there are these wells that are, all the investment in them has happened, all the work on them has happened, and people are just waiting to extract oil out of them. And there's a huge backlog of this, these wells that are ready for production, and people are just waiting for the right time to dig out oil from them, right? So we are seeing this explicit production increase that has happened. What is not always as visible to us is the fact that there is this additional huge frack log that is also out there, which means US has the ability to very, very quickly react to market changes and increase their production without significant investments if needed. Um, the other thing that has happened with shale producers is that as prices started increasing when OPEC decided to make cutbacks in production. As prices started increasing, um, US shale producers very quickly started hedging out their future production. A lot of them were comfortable with prices even in the $50 range. As prices crept up to uh, between 60 and 70 range, they were very comfortable hedging their future production at those levels, right? Now, and um, th they have, for a large part of 2018 and even into 2019, a reasonable part of their production is already hedged, hedged at these price levels. Okay. Now, while all of this was going on, obviously uh, OPEC ended up having a big problem, right? With all the oil getting pumped from shale, um, price of oil uh, or the future uh, of uh, oil price started becoming even more uncertain, right? So in the late 2015-2016 timeline is when OPEC decided that they would not hold back and they will try and do everything that they can do to regain market share, right? Um, and their aim really was that they will pump more oil into the market, gain market share, reduce prices, and use that to really weed out competition, right? Unfortunately for OPEC, however, that strategy did not really pan out as they expected. Shale oil was a lot more resilient. Uh, all the shale production was happening. That was happening. Um, those players were able to figure out how to continue to produce oil profitably even when the prices were going down. Right? So even though there was a little bit of a reduction in the US production, there was no significant impact. And therefore, the OPEC strategy seemed to be failing. Right? That's when they decided that they will cut back on production, use that to shore up the oil prices and make sure that they can sustain their economies. Right? Now, and uh, if you guys remember what OPEC had announced, so OPEC and few allied nations like Russia had announced that uh, they will cut down production by 1.8 million barrels. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing though about this is just before this announcement was made or just before these cuts really uh, started becoming applicable, both Saudi Arabia and Russia, who were the biggest players in that equation, were producing at peak levels. In fact, they had increased their production just before uh, getting into the cuts. 
right so obviously when the cut started happening anyways in the first few months compliance was patchy but not just that the compliance was patchy even though the sentiment was improving because there was expectation of supply cut but in reality what had happened was these guys had increased supply and then decided to cut it back right so the net impact to supply was not a whole lot and therefore in the initial phases of this cut we did not see a lot happening in the market in terms of price increases but that equation changed in last four or five months and right? now what changed right? for that let's look at the next slide um, and let's start with this first chart here um, um, so look at the uh, top right corner uh, what this is showing is that the target that opec and allied nations had set for cuts was 1.8 million barrels per day however recently they have significantly exceeded that target right so um, um, this one is showing that we got to 2.2 million barrels per day of cuts in fact i think more recent reports talk about the fact that um, the overall cuts may now be at close to 2.4 million barrels per day and the way this has been possible is if you look at uh, this chart uh, on the left what this shows is some of the key players in opec Right. Uh, and what their targets were versus what they have achieved. And you will notice that, for example, Saudi Arabia had a target of 486,000 um, barrels of cut. However, they have well exceeded that by about 100K. Venezuela, which has been going through a lot, excuse me, a lot of um, uh, internal struggles as a country, they had only planned to cut 95,000 uh, barrels of oil production. However, because of all the trouble they've been going through, unfortunately for them, the oil production went down by about 0.5 million barrels. Right? And if you look at it across all the countries, a combination of those has led to the fact that now OPEC is in a state where compliance is a lot more than they had initially planned. Right? So cuts ended up being more than planned. And while that happened, side by side, we were seeing synchronized global growth uh, picking up right and a combination of those two factors very quickly started increasing expectations of oil prices and, and we'll get into some of that in more detail um, let me show you guys this other chart this third chart uh, uh, on the right bottom now what this shows is if you look at it over the last two years what has happened with oil production right and what is very clearly visible here is that the biggest increase has happened from United States. So in this environment, United States has increased its production by 1.6 million barrels. Right? Then uh, two or three other countries to call out who are OPEC members, Libya, Iran, and Nigeria. Right? And Libya and Nigeria specifically, they were actually excluded from any cuts that OPEC was going to. They, they were actually left free to increase their production because they had gone through a whole bunch of trouble before this time. Right? And across Libya and Nigeria, they have increased their production by about 0.8 million barrels. Canada has increased production by 0.6 uh, million barrels and so on. Right? And on the other side, the biggest drops have happened from Venezuela, Saudi Arabia and Mexico. Right? Um, now, if you look at all of this and then try and peek a little bit into the future to say what's going to happen with supply in the future, um, then um, we should talk about some of these factors. And I'll come back to the previous slide in a bit. Right? So one of the top topics of discussion in the oil market currently is geopolitical risk. And obviously, geopolitical risk uh, has always been a factor in the oil market. Right? There has always been some form of Middle East tension. Recently, there was a spike in that across multiple dimensions, whether coming from Syria, Yemen, and so on. Right? And if you really look at what each of those events means individually, it, if it were related to a country that was itself producing a whole bunch of oil, then there is obviously a direct impact. Right? But at times, there is a secondary impact. right? And right now, Syria is not really producing a whole lot. So they, there's not going to be any direct impact uh, of the strife in Syria. But there could be indirect impacts. And one of the biggest ones could really be Russia or Iran sanctions. Right? And for Iran specifically, uh, uh, 
based of their nuclear deal and their discussions with us the waivers they had gotten they are up for renewal in may right and there's going to be a lot of scrutiny around that anyways there is a lot of rhetoric around whether those waivers should continue or not and through the actions that are happening in syria the other places in middle east it is there is some chance that you know, those sanctions may get put back again. And if that happens, obviously Iran will have trouble in uh, being able to sell all the oil that it is selling right now. Right? So that's one of the big risks out there. Venezuela continues to remain in trouble. Uh, its production continues to go down. And there are some analysts that are predicting that Venezuela production could potentially go down by another 400,000 barrels a day. Right? And that's a reasonably large number. Libya and Nigeria also are a little bit of a wild card. Their production has been extremely unstable, extremely volatile. They have been able to increase their production in the last two years. But if you go by history, that production is always at risk. It could go down at any point. Right? So all these factors can, all these really uh, uh, geopolitical factors could impact supply. On the other side, um, all the existing fields that are out there, they will go through their natural field declines. Right? And some of those fields have five to 9% uh, decline rates, others have three to 4% decline rates. Right? But there are enough fields that will be maturing and their productions will be declining. There's huge investment required to keep those the productions at those levels or to replace them. Right? And all investments in the oil space are right now being taken with extreme caution because people know that oil may not have a very long future. Right? And when I say a very long future, I'm really talking about a 40, 50 year period, right? So th there is a clear view of oil's need for next 20 years. What is that need for next 50 years is uncertain, right? And should those investments be made now or not is a question that all the players in the market are very closely evaluating. The other thing that they are doing is they are focusing a lot more on reducing their debt and increasing their shareholder payout rather than investing in capex right uh, and all this means that there could potentially be a reduction in production across the globe right now because of this lack of investment uh, these are some of the key factors that we'll have to worry about and closely monitor uh, as uh, we progress Right. Um, <clears throat> one other thing that I'll talk about, and I'll go back to the previous slide that I skipped earlier, is um, in, in, in talking a little bit more about the immediate term. Right. One of the things that OPEC had talked about was that they will be uh, doing their cutbacks till they can bring back inventory levels to historical normals. Right. Um, and uh, the chart that I have in front of you is showing U.S. inventory for crude and petroleum products. Um, so what you'll see here is the orange line shows what the absolute inventory number is. And the two white and gray lines show the trailing five year and seven year average. Right. And um, there are forums where some members of OPEC have talked about the fact that they would be targeting five year average. Some have said seven year average. But in general, I think more people have talked about the five year average. And if you look at it, and this is US specific data, uh, what you'll notice is that we have already uh, gotten to the seven year average and we are very close to hitting the uh, five year average. And the way inventory is getting drawn down, we are not too far from. Um, uh, being able to achieve that uh, and um, so, so I think there are a few things to take away from this graph one is that we have already at least in US gotten to the balance overall across the world uh, the gap is not significant so it's following a very similar trend but I think there is one other important thing to note from here so if you look at 2001 2002 time frame this is the point where the overall inventory used to be about 1500 uh, uh, million barrels right uh, it peaked at about 2100 and even when we get back to the five year trailing average we are still going to be at about uh, 1850 level right which is still significantly more than what it used to be earlier right so the fact is that there is still a lot of oil that is in inventory right um, 
Now, what would what will OPEC do? I think over the last few days, there has been some speculation that OPEC will continue with the cuts. They may even extend them. Right? And on the other hand, there have been discussions about how some of the member nations are talking about the fact that they don't really want to continue with the cuts. Uh, I think there is a meeting this Friday. There is another review that's going to happen in June to decide what's really happening with uh, the cuts. Will they get uh, extended or not? Will they continue till end of the year or not? Right. Um, but overall, as we uh, as we look at the demand side and look at the balance, what we'll realize is that the inventory targeting that OPEC was doing has almost been achieved, right? and uh, therefore OPEC may uh, not have a need to continue with production cuts just to achieve uh, inventory balance, but US production is going up. And therefore, if they want to control prices, they may still need to extend the cuts. Yeah. A little more on that in next few slides. Okay, so now that we've looked at supply and some of the key factors there, um, let's talk about demand. Right? And for demand, I'll start at a slightly different level. Um, let's first look at how demand is expected to uh, change over next few decades. And this chart that I've taken, which is based off um, analysis that BP does um, every year or every other year, right, uh, shows how the uh, need for oil will increase over years. And the interesting thing is, that you see that the overall demand for oil, so we, we are somewhere here, right? Overall demand for oil is expected to go up maybe by 15, 20%. However, if you look at some of the biggest consumers of oil right now, like North America and Europe, their demand for oil is actually going to go down. Most of the increase is going to come from Asia Pacific. And in fact, within that, mostly from India and China. Uh, actually, let's look at the next graph that's even more interesting. Um, that one, uh, so this graph is, uh, what this is showing is change in need for energy by energy source from 2016 to 2020. Right? So, and what I've done is obviously I've not put everything in here. I've only put the top change changes that are happening in the world, right? So across energy sources, across locations, what are the top changes that are expected to happen? If you look at China, right? so for China, the expectation is that their coal use will dip by a reasonable amount and all other forms of energy use will go up. So their gas usage, nuclear usage, huge bump in renewable usage and a reasonable bump in liquids usage will happen. For Europe, coal and liquids will go down, renewables will go up. For India, uh, India is power hungry right now, right? We are a growing nation. We will be amongst the fastest growing nations across the world. And India is going to be the fastest energy growth nation across the world. Right? And for India, the growth will happen across all dimensions, coal, liquids, renewables, gas, etc. Right? But the biggest changes are going to be across coal, liquids, and renewables. Right? And on the other side, if you look at US, their coal and liquids usage should go down and renewables usage should go up, okay? Now, uh, with this in mind, knowing where most of the change is going to happen, uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, and let's talk about two factors that will have a very significant impact on need for oil in the future. Uh, and surprisingly, this is one factor that is not talked about as much. Um, and I've put a few charts to talk about this, uh, the, and the topic really is efficiency, fuel efficiency norms, right? This first chart shows how efficiency across different uh, regions is expected, expected to increase over years. Some of those are already guidelines, some of those are mandates, and some of those are still things that the government is debating, but there is a lot of conversation about how efficiency increase needs to be mandated, right? And we are not talking about small changes in efficiency increase. We are talking about multifold uh, increase in efficiencies, right? Um, and, and even India, if you look at it, what India says is that it, 
it, it setting out norms or it is talking about setting out norms for efficiency increase uh, from 2017 to 21 by 10 percent and by another uh, 30 percent uh, beyond 2022. Right? Now, what does this really end up meaning? Uh, if you look at the overall uh, consumptions, and this is specifically for the transport sector, right? So. Uh, the 2016 consumption was um, at about 2.5 billion uh, tons equivalent of uh, energy use. Right? There's going to be a huge increase that will happen from two factors. One is income per head increase. Right? So obviously, uh, spending power of people will increase, and therefore the their energy intensity will increase. Right now, or use of energy uh, intensity will increase, and then there's going to be population growth across the world, which will increase the demand for energy. However, a large part of this increase will be offset by efficiency gains and therefore the overall increase in uh, demand for energy will not be uh, as significant as it would have been if other factors were to remain safe. Now, um, the uh, let's talk about the next factor which has significant impact on future oil demand right now which is uh, electric vehicles and uh, what have, and obviously there's been a lot of talk about electric vehicles uh, in the market right um, this has become a very hot topic since uh, tesla started with all the hype that got created through that through all the investments that chinese have been making in uh, electric vehicles and battery technology etc Right? And, and, and the fact is, this is how uh, the battery world has really been evolving, right? Now, what this chart is showing is how cost of battery packs has been reducing, right? And uh, this is something that is very similar to what happened with solar panels, right? Over last decade or so, as we got to uh, mainstreaming um, solar voltaic uh, panels, right? the cost of those decreased significantly. There were significant improvements in manufacturing technology. Obviously, there were significant improvements in uh, because just of efficiencies of scale, which led to a significant reduction in cost of panels. Something sim similar is starting to happening with batteries. Right? Now, they've gone through a lot of technology changes. They are going through continuous improvements. Uh, efficiencies of scales are starting to kick in, which are leading to rapid decline in cost of batteries. And the expectation is that as that happens, a lot of those batteries will get used for uh, manufacturing electric vehicles and we'll move off from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. Right? And obviously there is advantage of having uh, moved from zillions of parts that are there in an IC to lesser number of mechanical parts in the EV. So cost of maintenance, durability of those vehicles goes up, but not just that, the expectation is that cost will go down, it will become very competitive and it will become a cleaner alternate, especially because a part of that energy will be coming from renewable, renewable sources or at least that pollution will not be in city centers, but will be further out in um, far away locations. Uh, now, the important thing about EVs is EVs are going to happen. They are going to increase over time. Uh, and over time, they will become a significant portion of the overall transportation segment. But what does it mean for next 20 years? Right? And um, that's what I have this next chart for, uh, put through a slightly different dimension. So if you look at specifically the demand for oil from cars, Right? So if you look at really cars and bikes as a segment and look at all the demand coming from them, right? then uh, we started really uh, the uh, in 2016, the demand was about um, 19 million barrels a day. Right? Through growth in demand for travel through various factors, the expectation is that demand would more than double. Right? But then that demand will get offset by a number of factors. And this section is important to look at. What this is showing is that a large part of that increase is going to get offset by two factors, switch to EVs and other gains in fuel efficiency, right? which means that net increase because of all of this is not going to remain a whole lot. And anyway, let's talk about this a little bit more. See, pretty much every analyst that is out there is looking at multiple scenarios of how prevalent will EVs become. 
right? Will they end up being 10%, 20%, 40% of the work for, of the uh, car fleet by what time? Right? And now really there's a new metric that has started to come up because it's not really as important what percentage of cars are EVs, right? What is even more important is what percentage of kilometers will convert to uh, electric vehicle based kilometers, right? So for example, if all taxis were to convert into EVs, the number of kilometers they are running per day is significantly larger, right? So even though the as a portion of the overall vehicle population, it may be limited, but the overall kilometer usage may uh, uh, move significantly to EVs, right? But the point is, whatever that scenario ends up being, for the manuf uh, auto manufacturing industry, investments are going to happen on two fronts. One is around moving to electric vehicles. Second is going to be around how fuel efficiency can be improved. Right? And they will eventually end up balancing their investment across these two aspects. So it is possible that more investments happen. There is more rapid adoption of EVs and the reduction because of EVs ends up being higher. But if that were to happen, in all probability, lesser investments will happen on the fuel efficiency side. right? And but the overall reduction in need for oil will probably remain in the same range because of these two factors. Right? Uh, in most cases, however, the expectation is that at least over the next 20 years, the demand for oil will only be impacted by two to four million barrels because of EVs, at least in, in, in over the next uh, one and a half to two decades. Another factor that is going to impact demand for oil is shared mobility. Right? And obviously shared mobility through EVs will be even uh, more powerful. Right? Uh, and through all of this, what you will notice is that the expectation is that the overall demand for oil from the cars and bikes segment is not going to be a whole lot. Right? Now, we will pretty much remain at the same level that we are starting out at. And there will obviously be a uh, troughs and um, peaks in between, but overall across this journey, we expect to get back to the same levels. Right? So, so what does this really mean? Where is demand for oil really going to come from? It's not going to come from uh, cars and bikes, but it is going to come from alternate sources. Right? So an area of transport that is definitely going to see an increase in need for oil is the non-road segment. So whether it is aviation, um, rails, or shipping, global trade will continue to increase, global travel will continue to increase, and therefore that segment will continue to uh, put pressure on uh, oil demand. Right? Trucking industry will also cause an increase in oil demand, but then the fastest growing segment for oil demand is re really going to come from the non-combustible side. Right? It's really going to come from petrochemicals, from plastic, right? Stuff like that. Right? That is going to be the fastest growing segment for need for oil. Yeah. Um, so based of this, let's look at uh, some of the key factors uh, that will impact demand for oil. Um, the first, one, first most obvious one is GDP growth, right? Um, so GDP growth is the buzzword right now. The expectation is that growth will very ra rapidly happen across the world, immediately putting pressure on demand, right? But then on the other side, there are questions about trade wars, which could subdue it. Um, there, there are questions about, could there be a ban on uh, internal combustion engines? Can't, Countries or cities like Paris, Madrid, et cetera, have already talked about that, right? And some of these other factors, I think I've already discussed, but these are the factors that will be at play, which will really decide what the demand ends up being, okay? So with this, let's very quickly look at um, what this means for uh, supply demand balance, right? Now, overall, if you look at it in the longer term, right, most of the supply increase is really, um, sorry, on the supply side, most of the increase is going to come from US, from Brazil and Russia and the remainder from OPEC, right? If you look at it, the overall demand for oil, so is going to go up by about 22 uh, million barrels a day, right? Bulk of it coming from US and OPEC and a little bit by Russia and Brazil. Whereas most of the demand is going to come from India, China, and uh, remaining will be spread across Africa, Middle East and so on. 
in the in more immediate term, if you look at uh, 2018 specifically, and what I've done is I've put out two charts here to show two slightly diverging views. One of them is from IEA and the other is from OPEC. So what one thing that is common across both these charts is um, that both OPEC and IEA acknowledge that for this year, so th these are all numbers compared to the previous year, for this year, we should expect a significant increase in non-OPEC supply. Right? Um, the other thing that both of them talk about is that there's going to be healthy demand growth. However, they differ a little bit on how much the demand growth is going to be. Uh, OPEC expects demand growth to be a little higher, whereas IEA expects a little lower uh, demand growth. Right? And therefore, their view of what the balance is going to be and how much OPEC supply will need to reduce or inventories will need to reduce to bring that balance, their view is slightly different. Um, IEA expects that there will be a lot of need for draws either from inventory or from OPEC supply to keep the balance, whereas OPEC's belief is that they will not need to cut a whole lot more and uh, or if they cut more, then it will directly impact inventory. Right? And what's really going to happen is I think we'll have to monitor very closely all the rhetoric around trade war, around all the tensions happening in Middle East, and look for signals for could supply or demand be impacted by any of those. right? And that will really um, decide uh, the direction of price movement. Um, if I look at all the factors combined, my view is that the price in the 65 to 75 dollar range is probably a reasonable price not just for the immediate future future but also in the longer run see what will happen is this market is in a place where it knows it needs to tread cautiously and it will adjust both to supply and demand right so if there is more demand uh, supply can very quickly increase and therefore offsetting high increases in prices. On the other hand, if demand drops, then uh, uh, spe especially across shale and OPEC, they have ability to control their production and therefore not lead to significant runaway in price in either directions. Now, in the very short term, obviously, if there is any specific bad news that comes up or any significant news, for example, if Venezuela runs into significant additional trouble or if there are Iran sanctions etc there will probably be an immediate impact but in the longer run I expect prices to be closer to this range of 65 to 75 uh, dollars a barrel okay now with this let's very quickly look at what does this mean for India and impact to India right and when we talk about that I think the first thing obviously to talk about is taxes on oil in India Right. And um, in this, uh, don't worry about the absolute numbers that I'm showing here. Look at it more for the message. Right. Now, what this first chart is showing is that roughly uh, across um, all the, uh, uh, if you look at really what the consumer is paying for crude, uh, for uh, petrol and diesel, etc. Right. About 48% of that money is really going to the government through central exercise and CES or through VAT that is levied by state governments. Right? Now, what that means is that um, uh, this is being used to fund a reasonable amount of the fiscal. Right? And this has um, changed quite a bit over the last few years. For example, the excise duty uh, in itself has gone up by three to five times uh, from 2014 uh, to where it is now. Right? Um, and in, in, in my view, this was uh, an opportunity that uh, government was able to use to um, fund a number of their other schemes. Whether they have done it successfully or not, I'm not going to comment on that. But I think as a strategy, it made sense to uh, use this revenue. And this, is, this has been true both for the federal and the state government. Right? Both of them have had significant, have gotten significant advantage from uh, increasing uh, all the taxes and excise duty on um, on oil. What does this mean for the future? <clears throat> uh, what this means is, uh, so I think one thing that everybody talks about is fiscal deficit, right? And what will happen with fiscal deficit? If you really look at it, we have 
deregularize the price of petrol and diesel. So in theory, there are no subsidies there and therefore increase in crude prices if they were to happen should not have any impact on increased subsidy burden from there, right? But there are two factors on play. One is there is a little bit of subsidy on LPG and kerosene that will obviously go up if crude price goes up, right? And therefore have minor impact on the fiscal, but more important, we know that crude price increase will impact inflation, therefore will impact disposable income of individuals and increase cost of business. And we are heading into an election year, right? So this is definitely a tricky time. There, there will be decisions that governments will need to make about do they continue with this high level of taxes or do they reduce that to reduce the impact on end consumers? In my view, if you if if go back to the previous picture, right? If you look at it, Central government taxes are really fixed. They are not a percentage of the crude price, right? Whereas for the state governments, it is really a percentage. It would make sense to actually cap that. So while crude prices are going up, state governments could continue to earn a percentage and therefore continue to get even more out of this, but it would probably make sense to cut down there. However, with all the um, uh, politics and complications around politics, the answer may end up really being different. I, I think the more important impact for us immediately is going to be around current account deficit. Uh, with the prices going up, right? I, I think most of the analysts, what they calculate is that every $10 increase for uh, off crude price has an impact of about 0.5% to our current account deficit. And that is definitely going to be a worry for us. Right? Um, but, but let's look at it for India in the little longer term and talk about where is India headed. We have already talked about the fact that India is going to be the number one demand market, right? But where is India going to all of that, going to get all of that crude from? India's production is not really going up as much. And right? in fact, all attempts we have made at increasing our production have not made any meaningful dent in our overall production numbers or rather as a percentage of our overall consumption. Right? Now, I think the policies uh, the recent government brought in around uh, new licensing regime, etc., they make sense. They will provide some boost. But the fact remains that India's production is not going to uh, meaningfully Im make a dent in our overall consumption. Right? One hope was shale in India. There was talk about the fact that there could be shale reserves in India and we could uh, get advantage from that. Um, the fact is Indian geology is different. We have not yet been able to prove whether shale is really going to be successful in India. And we know that uh, land is constrained. We know that water is constrained in India and therefore shale could potentially be uh, uh, not a, a, a big play for us. Whereas on the other side, I, I think two interesting things that government has talked about is ethanol and methanol blending. Ethanol blending has not taken off yet and methanol blending they've just started talking about. But these two can help us reduce a little bit our dependence on foreign crude. The other thing that can definitely impact uh, demand is EVs, right? If you bring out a very clear, strong EV policy, then we have potential for replacing more crude demand. Right? But in spite of all of this, we know all of this is going to take time. And over the next 20 years, we will still need a lot of crude. Right? We will still be consuming a lot of oil. And therefore, we continue to expect a lot of investment in the refinery space, right? Um, and uh, whether Rosneft investing in India or Saudi Aramco investing in India are all really indicators of that. They want to ensure they have a captive uh, uh, demand point and the fact that there's going to be so much refining requirement in India, it makes sense for those investments to flow in. Right? So I think these will be the things that will really be at play in India, but for all practical purposes over the next 20 years, we should continue to expect that our crude import bill will only go up and not down. So with this, um, I think I've given you guys a quick view into supply demand balance and its impact on India. And now we can get into uh, Q&A. So uh, I see that there are a number of questions that have come in. 
let me uh, quickly uh, go through those and uh, talk about uh, some of them. Okay, so the uh, first one that I'm reading is from Manish Vad. Uh, what he says is that recently Perry has advised India to go for energy sources which are in abundance, sign signaling the use of both oil and gas. What, according to you, should India be doing given its increasing dependence on crude imports and its targets set to curb the same? Um, and uh, there's also a related question on EV. Hopefully I've talked about it a little bit, uh, especially in context of EVs, but if you talk about gas versus crude, see, in my mind, our need for both are going to continue to increase over the next 20 years. Um, but I, I would say that more focus of gas should really be on the pipe, natural uh, pipe gas side, uh, and maybe a little bit on the commercial side, not as much on the transportation segment. I think in the transportation segment, we have an opportunity of going directly from crude to EVs. Right? I think that journey will take us at least 25, 30 years for it to make a meaningful dent, but moving our transportation from oil to gas and then EVs will probably not be needed. We can do the direct shift. Right, but in this time frame, overall need for gas and oil will go up, and the only way we'll meet that is through increasing our import. Uh, on gas specifically, however, I'll point out one thing. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about um, this uh, thing about uh, methyl hydrates uh, across the coast of Andaman and even in uh, Godavari Basin. Uh, there are a lot of methyl hydrates, which can be a very rich source of methane. We still don't have technology that can very easily harvest that, but I think that is one area that uh, our government should invest in to look at and build a roadmap for being able to harvest methyl hydrates to at least supply part of our gas needs uh, uh, over the next 30 to 40 years. Okay. Um, the next question is from Rishabh. Uh, his question is about what effect do we expect out of India and China coming together to counter crude price rally? Um, in my mind, I see this little more as rhetoric than having a real impact. See, they, we will see both of us have slightly different equations because of our geographical locations and other implications. Right? China has a significant advantage where it can build pipelines directly from huge uh, energy production countries like Russia, right? Um, and therefore, they, they their supply chain uh, becomes slightly different. They also are closer to America in terms of being able to import from America compared to India, right? So economics for them is going to be different, whereas for them, right, for some of the shipping, shipments that happen from Middle East, it is significantly far off for us shipments from middle east are more convenient right so i think because of that we are in slightly different situations will we be able to form in in a way a cartel and negotiate better prices i am not very optimistic of that uh, and therefore i don't think a lot will uh, come out of uh, this okay uh, let's see the next so the next question is from Jainam Shah. The question is, why doesn't India import shale oil, which is so much in excess and hence, hence will be cheaper instead of importing uh, uh, from Dubai, Oman, etc. Right? Um, so I, I have a mixed answer to this. Right? So I think the first thing is, if we are able to diversify our supply sources, then that's definitely good for us. Through that diversification, we can get more competition. That is also good for us, right? So both as geopolitical risk and through being able to build competition across our suppliers, it is an advantage for us, right? Now the question is, is US a good source for this? Maybe, maybe not, right? And this goes back to the slide I was showing earlier about the spread between WTI and uh, 
Brent prices. As long as there is a reasonable diff between the two, I think it is going to be economical for us to import or ship all the way from US to India. But that may not always be economical compared to other crude grades. Right? We have to remember there is a reasonable amount of shipping cost. Right? But there is all, always innovation that continues to happen there. right? And there's an interesting one that um, uh, I'll point out. right? I think uh, it's probably in February. So there is this um, Saudi Arabian uh, VLCC. Right? VLCCs are these large tankers that can carry about 2 million barrels worth of crude uh, or uh, uh, amount of crude in one go, right? So a Saudi Arabian VLCC loaded US shale and shipped it to China. Right? So that is how the world is becoming right now. Through all the competition that is out there, through all the trading that is happening, everybody is looking for the cheapest ways uh, to get their supply. And I think for us, th those should be the two factors diversity of supply and economics right and us is doing some interesting things there right they're building a huge amount of infrastructure this saudi arabian uh, ship that i was talking about this was the first time a vlcc had actually loaded at louisiana right um, and there was no lightering that was required and what that did was that for that shipment the cost went down by about seven hundred thousand dollars which is huge saving right so as more and more investment happens in infrastructure across the globe specifically in in and around us right we will see some logistics efficiencies coming in and therefore it may be economical for us right but uh, it will not always be economical and that's something that we we'll have to watch out for uh, the next question is from Swapnil. Uh, this is about how are electric vehicles expected to affect the crude oil market? Hopefully, I've covered that through the presentation. Um, okay. Um, the next question is about with the US shale boom, do we see US as India's largest oil supplier in the coming years? Uh, and I think this is related to the previous question. I doubt that. Right? right now, the amount of oil that US is exporting is not a whole lot. Even in that, about 50% of that is probably going to China. Less than 5% is coming to India. If I, I don't remember the numbers. I think the number that came to India was probably 1% of their 2017 uh, export. But in any case, I don't expect for India, US to be a very large supplier it may be there in the mix uh, at some percentage but it will not be uh, amongst the larger suppliers is my guess um okay let's see what else um so there's a question from umesh lng landscape in india is moving at a snail space why is india having resistance towards lng uh, uh, based or gas based economy See, in my view, I think government has the right intent there. They are talking about the right things about uh, uh, increasing gas usage in India, whether it is at a domestic level, it is about bringing that cleaner fuel to uh, rural households, etc. I think the intent is right. All these schemes take time to implement. They take time for adoption. They take time for them to become prevalent. Right? And therefore, the demand for gas is not going to go up immediately at such a rapid pace. Whereas on the other side, if you look at it, uh, in the electricity production sector, LNG is probably never going to be economical for us, right? So we don't, we should not. So unlike US, where they have shifted a lot of their coal production to gas, we'll probably not see that happening in India because LNG at the cost point we will get it in India will never be competitive with coal or renewables, right? So I think LNG will grow, but it'll grow slowly and. Um, yeah, part of it is going to be demand growth and part of it is going to be infrastructure growth, right? There is huge investment required in building all the um, uh, the liquefaction or the uh, gasification plants, etc. to manage LNG. Uh, so it will happen at a slightly slower pace. Okay, um, we are close to time. There are still few more questions here, uh, but a question for... Uh, 
uh, you should we, should we continue or uh, is this a point where uh, we should stop and start yes, so, uh, i would request you to take just one more question and then we'll proceed to wrap up the session okay okay so the next question i have uh, this is again from manish vad um, the question is instead of making it a fight between shale and shake i like that quote uh, can't both work together for a cleaner air focusing on clean energy so essentially uh, focusing on clean energy um, while this would help opec diversify their crude oil dependence and for us could be gearing up for the foreseen future and so on right so I, see I, I think this is already at play it's not about whether they are going whether they work together or not this is going to happen if demand for oil goes down alternates will drive the economies right it's just that the uh, and i think that's what this presentation was trying to show that the fact is that oil demand is not going to go up significantly and at some point it will start tapering off but over next 20 years we still expect demand to go up right so i think these guys will uh, start moving and saudi arabia is making huge investments in renewables already but uh, that will only happen slowly over time and uh, i think for next 20 years a reasonable part of their business is still safe okay so with this we'll stop uh, all right uh, thank you mr aditya gandhi senior director of technology sapien consulting for the presentation on the topic crude global supply demand dynamics and impact on india unfortunately we won't be able to take all the questions due to time constraints if you have any other questions please send them at etenergyeditor@gmail.com it was an engaging and insightful talk and hope all the participants have enjoyed the session the recording of this webinar will be made available on etenergyworld.com thank you everyone for joining us goodbye thanks a lot everyone